Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Scouting for Growth. I am your host, Sabine van der Linden. Today, we have a fascinating guest joining us, Chris Miles, an unconventional financial advisor who calls himself the anti-financial advisor. Chris has an incredible backstory. He started his career as a traditional financial advisor, but soon realized his clients had little hope to achieving financial freedom using typical retirement investment strategies. This made Chris left the industry in his 20s to become a passive real estate investor, achieving financial independence and even retiring by the age of 28. Since then, Chris has diligently taught hundreds of entrepreneurs his formula for generating enough passive income to be work optional and then positioned to work by choice, not necessity. Over the past 13 years, Chris's personal clients have increased their cash flow by over $300 $300 million in total. Today, Chris runs a company called Money Ripples, dedicated to helping clients maximize cash flow. He also hosts his own podcast, which is highly, highly popular, also called by the same name, Money Ripples, where he shares contrarian money tips and investment philosophies compared to traditional financial advisors. So, During our conversation, Chris will share his incredible personal story, lesson learned overcoming major financial setbacks during the Great Recession, where he found himself over $1 million in debt. Alternative investment strategies beyond just real estate to generate passive income and actionable advice to start taking control of your financial future. You will not want to meet this unconventional interview with financial expert, Chris Miles. Welcome, Chris, onto the show. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for joining me on Scouting for Growth. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here. Appreciate it, Sabine. Well, I'm going to dive in straight and ask you why Are people calling you the anti-financial advisor? Well, because if you try to call me a financial advisor, they'd be wrong. Um, (laughs) Now, I used to be one, but the the problem is I realized when I was in that profession, I was just a salesman in a suit. I was selling people financial products, but was not really helping people become financially free. And uh, so it became kind of my mission to debunk that, right? To really like get people to go a different route that's actually been proven to work where on the financial advisor side, it hasn't been proven to work. So I'm kind of preaching people to not deal with financial advisors because let's admit it, financial advisors kind of suck. <laughs> yeah. So tell us about you. Where do you come from? You know, what has shaped your views around financial advice and what you are doing today with Money Ripples? Yeah, I was, I was raised by parents that you were kind of post-depression era parents, you know, they were born during World War II. And it's interesting when it came to money, I mean, they taught me good values. They taught me that your word is your bond to have integrity, you know, to work hard, to follow your dreams. But the one thing they didn't teach me in an abundance of was about money other than there wasn't enough of it, right? Hey, we can't afford this. What do you think I am made of money? Money doesn't grow on trees. You know, those kind of phrases I was always taught growing up. And so I thought I wanted something different. I wanted a different life where it wasn't just about paying bills and then dying. I didn't want that kind of life, you know? So um, after I was going to college, I realized I was going to become a business consultant, but I thought, shouldn't I have real life business experience if I'm going to go into business consulting? So I actually took a sabbatical from college to go and just find some business to start. And the first one that came up that was intriguing to me was being a financial advisor. Interesting. You know, and not knowing they take anybody off the street, as long as you have a, you know, you could pass a test and you can, you, you don't have a criminal record. You could become a financial advisor. You don't have to be a financial genius or anything. But, uh, you know, having my own business, I started to love it so much. I actually stayed dropped out of college. I never went back. I stayed in that financial advisor world for four years. 
And towards the end of those four years, my dad came to me and he says, Chris, when are you going to become my financial advisor? And now understand that my dad was very guarded about his money. He, he was the kind of guy that he was cheap. He saved everything he could, he could. In fact, all he taught me about money was save it everything and we don't have enough. So you got to save every penny you can, right? Well, I sit down with him. I see his money for the very first time in my entire life. And I see that he's been stuffing money in his 401k, his retirement plan for the last several decades. He'd paid off his house early, totally debt-free. He had done everything right from what I taught as a financial advisor. Yet, it wasn't enough. I said, Dad, listen, if you want to retire today, he's 61 years old at this time. I said, if you want to retire today, you better hope you die in five years because that is when you're going to run out of money. Oh, my. Okay, Chris, that's not what I want to hear. What do I do? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, I don't know, because you did everything that we teach. You did everything right. And that bugged me because I realized, although I wanted a different journey, a different path than my own father, mm -hmm. I was on that same path because I was being cheap. I was saving every penny I could, throwing it into the stock market, gambling it away into other people's companies, not my own, so that hopefully someday I might have some sort of life only to find out it's just not enough. And it wasn't just him. All of my clients, none of them were really truly financially free where they didn't worry about money. And even worse, the financial advisors can't retire off of their own advice either because there's guys that were working in my office at the late 1970s. They've been there for 30 or 40 years and still couldn't retire. That is when I realized I was in the wrong profession and in 2006, I couldn't make it work. I couldn't stay in integrity and keep doing what I'm doing. So I left. I said, no more. I'm not going to be a financial advisor. I'll just be a mortgage broker and teach ballroom dancing on the side. Oh, wow. And that's yeah, what, ballroom what ended up happening. Well. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. amazing. I know. One of, the, one of the many weird things about me, right? <laughs> which, which are important, right? It's, it's actually build your authenticity to actually have your your passion and your hobbies like ballroom dancing and actually mm -hmm. follow your your path and your 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 vision and goals. So tell us what are you doing today? Yeah, so t so interesting thing is in 2006 I was like now on my own. I didn't know what to do, but I knew that I wanted to do something different. And when the students ready, the teacher appears. Yeah. And so um, at that time, you know, I had a I had a friend I trained to be a financial advisor. I love that he quote. actually when the, when the teacher is ready, the students appear. This is a great quote. I'm going to use it. That's right. Yeah, and it's true because uh, I remember my friend, I trained him to be a financial advisor, but he went to go do real estate investing. And so I started going more that route into the alternative investment space. And actually later that next year, into that, like later that year in 2006, I was 28 years old, almost 29, and I was able to retire because I had enough passive income, cash flow coming in to pay my bills, my monthly bills. And that was that blew my mind because remember in the financial world, everybody tells you you should be you know, uh, accumulating money, right? Save up all this money and eventually you'll live on less than the interest in retirement. That's what they teach you. So I remember my goal as a, as a financial advisor was if I could save $2 million, I'll live on 3%, which is 60,000 a year or 5,000 a month. 20 years ago, I used to think 20, 000, or I used to think that 5,000 a month was pretty good life. And it kind of was. Unfortunately, now, you know, uh, less it's than 20 years today. later, mm -hmm. it's about double that today. That's right. It's like, or really that value is cut in half, right? Um, so that would be like the equivalent of somebody saying, all I need is 100,000 a year and I'm good, right? Well, that's what a lot of people say, or 10,000 a month is what often I'll have people tell me is their goal for fun passive income. Well, I, you know, I was actually able to have enough passive income, not because I accumulated a lot of money, but because the money that I did have and the resources I, I had in that moment, I was able to go and buy investments, especially those that are backed by real assets like real estate. And then those assets pay me consistent monthly cash flow. And, uh, and that blew my mind that that was even possible because again, I thought $2 million to live on the less than the interest, right? But that wasn't the case. It was, I was hoping to do that by the time I was 40, but in real estate, I was able to do it when I was 28. So of course, like any, like anybody would probably do, like in your 20, you're 28 years old and you're, you're basically retired. People are like, how did you do it? Right. And that's, and that's why in 2007, I came out of retirement to teach people how to do what I did. It's to help them 
figure out how to become work optional, right? Where you work because you want to, not because you have to. You have enough money coming in that you can pay your bills. You can show up to work or not. Well, second quote, right? You went back to you went back to work to actually enable uh, other people, which is which is absolutely mm-hmm. commendable. I want to ask you first before I go into my next question around this contrarian. Uh, approach you have is what is your feel around the real estate market right now? Because I've been talking to quite a lot of people where I think the last bump we had in the road was 2008, 2009, based on some of the um, real estate investors I've talked to in recent weeks. What's your view around how real estate investors are performing and whether we should still put our money into real estate? Yeah, that's the number one question is always asked. And it's really been asked that way for years because 2008, we saw a real estate market crash. Even though that's the first time it crashed in several recessions, still it's that recency bias, right? We believe that something like that that happened recently is going to happen again. So with real estate, and there now there, there is stress in real estate. In fact, I have friends in the real estate space that have said the last two years, 2022 and 2023, now we're going to 2024, right? They said the last few years have actually been the worst years in real estate that they've had, even compared to 2008. So even in 30 years, they're saying this is the worst time. But here's the key point you got to remember. What kind of real estate are they talking about? Those guys specifically were talking about commercial real estate, such as apartment buildings, maybe self-storage units, things like that. But apartment buildings especially, see... When the government pumps a lot of money, right? Because governments are not exactly known for being uh, honest people. When they start pumping a lot of money into the economy, they overinflate everything. They created this everything bubble, whether it's a stock market, crypto, whatever it was, everything was going up, including real estate. The problem was where a lot of that money went into were apartment buildings. And in, in a lot of the big money, the, the institution money was going into apartments as well, buying it, driving up the prices. And remember, prices in apartment buildings are more based on risk factors and also cash flow, profits. It's not like a a house. A house is a very, residential real estate is a very different market. It's all based on what a consumer will buy it for. But in the commercial side, when you're dealing with apartments, they buy it based on how much profit is there in that property. Well, as we all know, as interest rates shot up so quick, so fast, that destroyed (laughs) those numbers especially if they had to refinance on it. And that's what a lot of people were having to do is they they did short-term bridge loan financing, right? Where they only get a loan for a year or two or so. And then that loan comes due and they got to refinance it at whatever rate is at that point. Well, when interest rates have gone up so much higher compared to their numbers, their analysis, that created stress in the market. That's why you hear in the news and the media, which the news, by the way, only talks about old stuff. They always talk about what's happened in the past, never what's happening in the future. And so they're talking about the things that have already happened in the in this real estate space with apartments, especially where that space got hit because people are worried about how they're going to be able to refinance the short term lending that they got and that they can't support the numbers. Yeah. So long story short to, to your question is this, is that real estate, it depends on which pocket of real estate you're looking at, because if you look at apartments, They've had a lot of stress and I I don't want to invest in apartments right now. I might wait six or 12 months before I start investing there again. Okay. But residential real estate and depending on where in the United States, because there's so many different markets, residential real estate's still awesome. It's still cash flowing. There's still good, solid returns. And, and by the way, and that not even just that, even not owning real estate, do you know that you can actually invest in real estate without owning the property? Because, for example, you can lend money to real estate investors to do their projects, whether renovating or flipping or they're buying properties and, and renting them out, whatever they're doing, you can lend money to them and get a contractual rate of return of like 10, 11, 12 or higher percent per year on your money. Yeah. And so when I'm investing in real estate, I rotate. I rotate around. I like I look at where the opportunity is. So for the last few years, debt has been great. I lend money to real estate investors and I get paid a contractual return. Um, I still own real estate, but I've actually been selling some of that real estate because I can sell at higher prices as the price has inflated to be able to get the cash and then reinvest somewhere else. Super interesting because um, the point you have made around 
lending to investors in real estate is one of the points I've heard many times in recent months. And um, yes, there's a market for it, and it's growing as well in the United Kingdom. The other point you made around interest rates, I was talking to a very well-known UK uh, influencer with one of the top five podcasts, um, at least in our market, and I think as well in the world. He was actually highlighting that, you know, on average, as uh, mortgage owners, we probably, you know, whether you are owning in you know, a residential um, real estate or apartment real estate, your mortgage or, or the rental cost was probably 2%. Actually, it was nothing for a very mm -hmm. long time. Now, most um, investors have to refinance and the rates of right. 7 to 10%, something no one expected. And mm -hmm. um, that is actually creating a massive pinch on a lot of those investors um, right now. So interesting situation we are economically. But I would like to go into you as Crest, the contrarian. You are contrarian in terms of money and investing. Can you tell us how you moved, I mean, as you came back to work life, let's say, after retiring, what got you to be the contrarian in that world of investing and money making? Well, it was it was a, kind of a, a, an evolution, right? Because, I mean, definitely one thing I love is I love teaching. I love helping and serving in that way and teaching and helping people. And I especially love teaching something that that can change people's lives. It can be a catalyst for people to be able to get real results in their life. Well, after being a financial advisor, I really just sold what I call hopium, right? You just sell them hope, you know, and dreams and 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 wishes, but you really don't give them real life results. The you always tell them in 40 years you'll have a million, two million, three million dollars or whatever, right? You tell them that in the future, but there's no evidence that you're gonna have that much money. And by the time people will actually figure it out, you'll probably be retired at that point yourself, maybe, unless you're broke and still working as a financial advisor. So I realized that because I was that person, I was self-deceived and because I had inadvertently, right, unintentionally deceived other people to believe in the traditional financial advice that's out there of save everything, spend nothing and pay off all your debt and your life will somehow be wonderful. And that's just not the case. And so after I became more financially independent myself, I had asked myself, what, so what? <laughs> I can be comfortable and happy doing vacations and just being, you know, just, just relaxing. I could do that, but I believe that God's put me on this planet for a reason. And whether your belief is that's fine, but I believe that God puts you on a planet, gives you certain gifts and abilities that you can develop here to use to bless others' lives. And I really felt it was a responsibility of mine to bless more lives. That if I'm being given this gift this realization and as well as this knowledge about money that could help other people, I can either just be happy and with myself and be selfish. I think that's a selfish thing to just take care of my family only, or do I take care of the world? And that's right. Why my company's called money ripples. It's that ripple effect that you can create in people's lives. As you're blessed financially, you have a greater capacity to bless the lives of those around you. And I believe I have a sacred duty to help other people and teach them this. So tell us a little bit more about your vision and mission at Money Ripples. And you have a company and you have a podcast. So tell us a little bit more how those two, um, I would say businesses or projects intertwine mm -hmm. one another. Yeah, my vision is really to help at least a thousand families become financially independent by 2030, You know where they are work optional, right? They could retire or they could keep working, but they work because they just want to work. Um, that's, that's the vision. And the mission really is to help people create prosperous, lives, right? Like it's really to create freedom and prosperity in their lives so that they do have choice and options. And they're not just stuck living from paycheck to paycheck, just trying to survive and get by, but to have that choice to be able to create something more in their life so they can bless more people. And so, and that's, and that's what we do. So I have the podcast. That's one of the ways I can reach people very easily is that, you know, whether it's, you know, with our Money Ripples podcast, you know, we have, you know, a YouTube channel. We're actually the top one percent, actually now top half of 1% of podcasts worldwide. So we're very excited to be in that category now. And Nice. And, uh, um, and really top not 0.5%. So, but you're even higher than me. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
No, that's a big, even where, where you're at, that's a huge accomplishment. I'm, I'm in my 10th season of my podcast, right? So it's been growing gradually over time. Um, I'm always amazed when people get in the top 1% and they did it in less than a year. I'm thinking, Two you're years. amazing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> two years. I know. See, it took me five times to do what you already pretty much have done yourself. Um, I'm a slow learner, I guess. But um, but in any case, yeah, that's that's what we do. You know, moneyripples.com, we teach that kind of stuff. And it's really, again, about educating people and giving them a different path. Like you said, it's contrarian. But that's a but that's the thing. I when people always ask me, they're like, Well, Chris, why why be contrarian? Right? Why, why are you doing this? You know, what, what's the whole purpose? Well, think about it. If in here, I'm I'm using American stats, right? In the United States. They, uh, one of the biggest, largest companies is called Fidelity, you know, financial company. They have 45 million clients, 45 million Americans invest in their retirement accounts. Yeah. Yet of those only 750,000 have at least a million dollars in there. 750,000. And when you go off traditional advice, they're only supposed to pull out 3%. So that means if you have a million dollars, you live on $30,000 a year, which in the United States is at the poverty line. <laughs> so you're a broke millionaire and, uh, and, and of those, and that's why of those people that one and a half percent that happen to have a million dollars of those people that have been polled and surveyed over one third of them, 35% said it will take a miracle to retire, right? They believe that they'll never be able to retire. So that really means there's only a 1% success rate. Imagine if you went to Google reviews, right? You went to see the reviews of a, of, of a particular cafe that you're going to see. And the reviews might be like, you know, 4.5, 4.8 stars, right? Well, what if you went and saw the reviews? 99 had a one-star review. Only one had a five-star review. Would you go eat there? Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's but that's what people do every day in the financial world is that they see that only 1% are successful or even feel successful. And, and still they preach that this is the way to go. This is this is like the Mandalorian. This is the way, right? It's not the way. It's been proven not to work. Where on the other side, in alternative investments, especially with real estate, we have tens of millions of us that have made it work. So why not go for where evidence lies? Go for where it actually works. That's um, a very wise statement, actually. And I never looked at it personally that way either, Chris, actually. We work with financial services. I do. And um, a lot of them are highly respected companies because, mm -hmm. you know, they have been vetted. They are triple A companies. But when you look at it from your point of view, it's interesting because, yeah, must, I mean, probably many of us do not really know where we are with our, you know, investment uh, results um, from, mm -hmm. you know, having put our money in those big uh, financial institutions which takes me to case study and achievement. So what have you been able to achieve with your clients over the past 13 years, Chris? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it's kind of been mentioned in our bio, but uh, I mean, we've improved their cash flow by over $300 million with just less than a thousand clients over the last 13, Incredible. now going on 14 years. Um, and that's actual like tangible money, <laughs> right? Um, and that's year after year. So like, for example, let me, let me talk about a few cases here. Um, you know, one, one person's case, this was, we more got them to start tracking money. You know, that's one thing we try to get our clients to do is start tracking their money. Well, this woman was making a quarter million a year between her and her husband, and they felt broke. We found out they're spending $5,600 a month, just eating out 5,600 <laughs> a month, just eating out. Um, that doesn't include the groceries at home that they're also spending over $1,000 a month on. So I told them, it's like, let's get this down to maybe 1000 a month eating out, do more eating at home, just you know, a little bit more. Not a lot. I mean, it's still 1000 a month eating out is pretty generous. Yeah, it's but a nice, nice meal for two, right? Once a week, right? And when you're looking at the current economic environment, I think, mm -hmm. you know, if you put that on the budget for me, which is a budget I have with my husband, you know, yeah. once a week. Really nice meal, Mr. V, I call him. Um, but that takes you to the thousand, you know, dollar yeah. a month, right? Budget rather than an everyday budget. Time. That's right. Yeah. And for them, it was just all they had to do is start tracking their money. And when you're tracking it, you're aware of it. You start to, you actually start to make different decisions. Uh, we freed up over like 6,000 a month on their budget side. 
On the other side, we also helped them free up money on tax savings because they were overpaying on taxes. So we helped free up some money there. I mean, in total, they freed up over seventy seventy five thousand dollars in the first year alone. You know, that's that's huge. You know, even when you're making two hundred fifty thousand, getting seventy thousand dollars back is a big deal. I agree. Um, another example, and this kind of combines both elements of passive income and the the cash flow freeing up cash type of thing. Um, we had one client that came to us; they had five million dollars in stocks. They said, hey, we've got a bunch of money in stocks, but we're maybe looking to diversify away from that a little bit. So we started looking at the situation. So they wanted to look at new real estate. But when we first looked at their full cash flow, we actually analyzed, you know, one on one when we're working with people, we look at all their cash flow. We're not investment advisors. We tell people very clearly we're not that we're not registered investment advisors of any sorts, but we are consultants and trying to look at the whole cash flow situation. Well, we found out, we said, listen, before we even invest, we can actually take some of these loans that you have, consolidate it within your mortgage and free up $4,000 a month with a mortgage refinance and paying off all these other loans. Let's do that first. That's almost $50,000 a year. We can free up even before investing $1. Yeah. So we did that first. And then, then we started focusing on doing the real estate side of things. And that was pretty exciting because, you know, now they've already got up to about a couple hundred thousand dollars a year of passive income. They haven't sold off all their stocks. They're still keeping some of it. They're holding on to some of their favorite stocks and whatnot. But still, now they're, they have more control. They have more passive income coming in that their stocks couldn't provide. And, you know, here's the thing is, yeah, you know, I don't want to poo-poo all over financial advisors too much because I know I was one of them, right? I was in that, I was in that, that battlefield, so to speak. And the thing I'll say is this, is I know most financial advisors have good hearts, but they don't work for the clients. They work for the companies they work for. They work for those institutions like you mentioned, right? And those institutions have self-interest, which is fine. They offer a service. But when you start thinking about how financial education has been taught, it's been taught from those companies to the financial advisors and then to all the rest of us, right? So if you think about it, like how many times have you heard high risk creates high returns? How many, how many times have we heard that, right? All the time, all the time. All the time. But is that really true? Because if that were true, why aren't the financial institutions taking high risk with their money? They don't. They'll take high risk with your money, but they won't take high risk with theirs. What do they do? They charge their guaranteed fees coming out of the assets under management all the time, don't they? they if do. they really believed high risk creates high returns, they'd say, you know what? We're not going to get paid unless you make money, which does not happen. They will always make their money, whether you make money or not. They don't believe in high risk creates high returns. They believe that you taking high risk, it gives you a potential for higher returns, but they the take fees are still covered. The higher ret- yeah. And, and think about in business, right? Business, if you take a high risk all the time, you will lose a business. You will go bankrupt. You know, you take calculated, very calculated risks in your business. Mm-hmm. What if I took high risk with my health? If that were the case, you know what I should do? I should actually eat up at McDonald's every single day. I should supersize myself because that will make my health better, right? That does not work. What if I took high risks in, in my marriage? What if I did things to ignore them, you know, like just do everything possible to not work on my marriage? Well, I'm going to lose the marriage, right? If I took high risks with my teeth and I stopped brushing them and taking care of my teeth, I'm going to lose my teeth. If I took high risks with my money, I should go buy lottery tickets, not go invest in mutual funds, Right. Think about it like these, when it's a true principle, it should apply in every facet of life, not just money, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense in other aspects of life. Why would it make sense with our own money? So when we are taught these things like high risk rates, high returns, or you're in it for the long haul, right? You know what? If the market goes down, just stay in another 10 years, which by the way, that's what my dad did is follow up on my dad's story. After I sat down with him, I was kind of on a mission to figure out how to help him. I couldn't put him in new things because I didn't want to gamble his money away. But I said, I, I got to find something. Well, my dad, because the market went down up and down a few times, especially in the two thousands, he had to work into his seventies and still to this day, he's about to turn 80 years old. He's just trying to stretch out his money as long as he possibly can while getting some government support from, you know, the, the welfare and things like that for, for those that are elderly here in the United States, he's getting some of that, but he's trying to stretch his dollars as long as he can. He outlived what he, he, he never thought he'd make it to 80 in the first place. Um, he was the kind of guy that did supersize. <laughs> he was the kind of guy that ate the fast food and smoked cigarettes and still somehow he beat the odds. 
But um, but that's the thing. He's just trying. He's alive, but he's not living. And that's the thing I want to make sure that we stop, right? We want to make sure that people actually get to the point where they can be alive and live today. Just like it says right on my sign, live your life now, not tomorrow, right? Because people always told in financial advising someday, what about now? And that's the one key distinction with all of our clients. They have like it's, the average client finds in the first year about $35,000 that they'll improve their cash flow or passive income in just that first year alone. But if they start to reinvest that year after year after year, that income just keeps growing and growing and growing exponentially. That's the difference. That's something that changes your life today. Heck, you remember COVID? I mean, you remember that that was so crazy? Um, one of my clients works in Hollywood. Hollywood shuts down all the time. I mean, Correct. they just shut, shut down because of a writer strike. Well, during COVID, luckily we, we had passive income coming in that he was able to not have to find work. He was able to have money coming in to keep paying for him. That's 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 not something that's about just retirement. That's something about today because we don't know what's going to happen in life. We don't know if there's going to be another government shutdown. We don't know what's going to happen, but we can control what we do with our money to actually get it to pay us money so that now we have the option of whether we work or not. One question which came to my mind as you are uh, talking, Chris, is is your own experience and the validation as to why you can actually help your client. Because I remember during our conversation, you know, you became financially free after an over one million dollars that yourself you had, and you learn amazing lessons from that, right? So yeah. can you tell us what are the lessons we all need to remember as we try to build financial freedom? Yeah, it's an interesting part of my my journey because I became financially free in 2006. But when the recession hit and I, I started gambling with money, I started taking high risk with my money. I was then all of a sudden, the we I started a new business. The business was tanking. My own personal portfolio was tanking as well. And so I I got to the point where I was over a million dollars in debt because I was sinking in the hole each and every month. And I had to dig out of that hole. I didn't file for bankruptcy, although it would have been easier if I did because it would have been easier to start from zero than negative one million. Um, but I had to start digging out of that $1 million debt hole. And so I eventually became financially independent the second time at the end of 2016. So I've actually done it twice before I turned 40 years old. And the lesson I learned, I'll tell you, the, the big thing I learned there is, is one, never take your eye off of creating income, right? Especially passive income. The one thing I did wrong then that would have helped is that uh, when I started that new business, one of the partners said, listen, Chris, cut off all these other income streams. Just focus on the mission that we have here. So I was dumb. I didn't take my own advice, which you'd think if I'm teaching people how to get out of the rat race, don't get myself back in the rat race. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's lesson number one, right? So have passive income. You need to have cash flow under control. That's why I started watching my money, why I started to analyze what's going on. Two, have good cash reserves for those emergencies. I had some reserves, but it wasn't enough to make up for that negative cash flow after just a few months even. Um, you know, I, I, tr I keep at least six to 12 months of reserves that I don't invest. Even though I get people all the time, they'll say, okay, Chris, I just saved up $20,000. What do I do with it? I said, nothing. Keep it. Sit on it. <laughs> you know, it's Let it be it. there to keep you safe because it's, it's not just about the money. It's not just about if something bad goes wrong, but there's something that happens to you mentally and emotionally when you know you're safe. When you don't think you're safe, you all of a sudden get in a panic mode. And when you're in panic mode, your brain stops creating good solutions you end up finding yourself in a bigger hole. That happened to me. I had some reserves, but I made this big mistake. I took some of the money that I had in 2006 and 2007, and I started putting it into my house because I was a, I was a mortgage broker. I thought if I ever need to get money out of my house, I just refinance and get the money out. I'll pull the money out. Well, that wasn't the case in 2008 because actually not even by 2008 in the U S in by the by the fall of 2007, they would not let me pull out any money from my house at all. Even though there was equity in that home, and even though everybody would tell you, pay off your house, I couldn't get to the equity in my house. And eventually that's why the house values dropped and I lost that equity. I had to foreclose on that property. I lost that house in the courts, right? Because I couldn't keep making the payments because I was in a bad cash flow position. But I also 
there I couldn't sell it because it was all of a sudden because the equity was dro dropping, all the equity dropped and I was upside down. I was had negative equity after some time, after a few years. So I ended up losing that house in 2009 and got nothing for it. And so all that equity I threw in would have been better off in cash in my hands, whether it's in the bank or somewhere else, having that cash liquid and available to use. Most people are taught to keep their money in prison, as I call it, right? You lock it away in retirement accounts where you get penalized, at least in the United States, you get penalized if you try to touch that money. Right. Or yeah. two, you throw it into paying off your debt, which again, whenever you need money, that's when the banks will never give you money. So trying to put extra money to pay off my house faster was a very high risk gamble that didn't work for me. I actually ended up losing as a result of that. So I tell people, yeah, it's good to pay off debt, but do it reasonably, do it on a very slow basis, keep more cash liquid because that you can do a lot more with cash in your hands than when it's not. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Well, Chris, thank you very much for this. So going to my last question, where can people find you and any top tips for entrepreneurs who are listening to this conversation? Because I think potentially when you look at the where the world is going and we don't know whether investment is going to come back to the entrepreneur world, right? It's still a very uncertain market. What tips would you give them to actually create that financial freedom? And also, please tell us where we can find you. Yeah, top tip I give any entrepreneur, if no matter what the markets are doing, there's one strategy that I learned that always works 100% of the time to have success in your business. And that's simply this, find ways to create more value for people, find ways to solve problems, add value or serve people in a way where money is just a natural byproduct. It's just a receipt of the service that you're rendering and offering, right? That's the key. Once I learned that money was no longer mysterious, money was predictable. It was formulaic. It was very easy to be able to create because I didn't focus on how do I make more money? I started focusing on how can I serve these people? How can I solve problems for people? And people, by the way, have a lot of problems. There's a lot of problems to solve out there. How can you solve their problems in a way that money is going to be the natural exchange? Because they want to give you that money so that they have that solution in their life. That is the true key for any business at any time, any market, any economy, no matter where you are in the world, that always works. That's the key. That's, so that's my advice for entrepreneurs there today. Um, if you want to find me, you can always go to moneyripples.com or you just look up Money Ripples podcast on on whether you go to Spotify, iTunes, or even uh, YouTube. Yeah, all channels. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining me on Scouting for Growth today and giving us so much insight and valuable content for us to think about financial retirement, financial freedom, and how we take care of our money today. So thank you for joining me. It's been such an honor. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Scouting for Growth. Please subscribe, share with friends, and leave a five-star rating. Your rating is so valuable. I review all of them, and my team help me adapt content to meet your needs. Also, connect with me on my preferred channels. I am a B2B growth expert, so you will find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Threads, and X as well, as well as Blue Sky. All information available below. Until next, keep scouting for growth.